Thank you very much. Okay, so I just had someone speak in my ear. I'm just going to share my screen one moment. And I'm hoping that is now visible to you. Can I just have a thumb? Yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Adele. So um, good evening, everybody. Um, as it's been mentioned, my name's Simon Bale. Um, I work for Avon and Somerset Constabulary, Avon and Somerset Police, and I'm one of the uh, contingency uh, planners, or better known as, a, as an emergency planner. Uh, my role involves preparing the constabulary and especially all of the commanders with uh, relevant training as well as uh, preparing plans for emergency situations. So part of my role is to uh, oversee plans for the police and multi-agency response to incidents at uh, nuclear sites under the REPIA regulations or uh, coma, control of major accident hazards. Um, as well as all manner of different incident types that you can probably imagine the police get involved with. Um, I've got a couple of my uh, colleagues on the on the call here I can see uh, looking at me and I work alongside them uh, with regards to different areas that do cross over into the health and safety world. And part of this pre presentation does actually cover health and safety that you will see very shortly. So I'm going to move on. Um, and basically tell you what Jessup is. So uh, Jessup, um, the aim of Jessup or the Joint Emergency Services Interoperability Principles was to basically raise awareness of the interoperability between all the services because it's fair to say we don't or we didn't always work together we were very much working in silos. And you probably come across that in your own organizations or across industry where people don't work together. It isn't good for, for the business and it certainly isn't good in an emergency response. The public expect us to deliver a service and that service can only really achieve what we want by sharing information, by working together and, and having a, a, you know, a successful outcome. So initially Jessup was a two year program. Um, it was set up as the Jessup or Joint Emergency Services Interoperability Program between 2012 and 2014. And this came about after the London 7-7 bombings, which you'll probably know was many years before 2012. Well, it took the government a little while to work out what was needed following all the inquests. And it was primarily about the way we, the police, worked with the fire service and the ambulance service, because it was kind of focused around what had happened in London. Um, it was all about responding to major incidents and business that wasn't the usual business that we would deal with. However, it was soon realized that the Jessup principles that they began to introduce should be used in daily business. And that is what we have basically aimed to achieve. I'm going to say we're not there fully, not, not for absolutely everything, but certainly multi-agency working and major incident response. I think we are getting there. I think we're, we are far better than our predecessors were years ago. So following that program, which should have ended in 2014, it was only about 2019 that the Jessup team became a lot smaller, and that's the central Jessup team up in London, that it's all now being run in the regions. And for my sins, part of my role is to coordinate the Jessup delivery, to all the emergency services across the southwest. So from the Cornish Fire Service, right the way across to the uh, Bournemouth Hampshire border, up to Wiltshire, Gloucester, and of course, Devon and Cornwall, Dorset. So all of the emergency services within there, plus some of the crossover with the British Transport Police from their national hubs, as well as HM Coast Guard, uh, Closest to us being Milford Haven, 
um, and also the National Centre in Fareham. I help coordinate uh, the, the, the delivery. So what you are getting is a whistle stop tour of Jessup, which would normally take a commander at least a, a 10 hour uh, training course, as well as various bits of online learning. And, and the dreaded, what the police call NCult, uh, which is a, a lot of videos um, for us to watch. So why was there a need for interoperability? Well, findings of public inquiries, inquests and lessons learned, lessons identified. And for those that may be following the Manchester Arena inquest, there will still be more lessons to learn and there always will be. OK, so there was a need for interoperability. Primarily, it was after the 7-7 bombings. There was the inescapable requirement of better coordination and cooperation. And that's not only to save lives, but also in times of austerity, not one service could achieve all of the aims. Um, certainly the police service is a lot slimmer than it ever was. And we can't provide what I think the public expect. However, does it need a police officer or does it need uh, an emergency responder? So that way, working together, we are able to achieve our aims. And of course, single service response arrangements and local procedures, they're all now in line with what we call the Jessup Doctrine. And the Jessup Doctrine, the, the way we should do things, has only recently been updated to version three, and that's only in the last few, few weeks, and it is available on the publicly facing Jessup website. So anything we talk about tonight, if you go to www.jessip.org, it will come up, okay? So single service response arrangements, it, you might be surprised that, but if we look locally towards Bristol, Bristol Airport, uh, if there was an incident a few years ago, um, the rendezvous point for the police might have been gate A. Well, the fire service had on their plan, they were going to gate C and, ambulance service we're going to gate f and so on and we weren't joined up and that was part of my role when i switched over from a previous role within the constabulary to emergency planning was to help bring together our alignment to make sure that we are all looking at the same maps the same grid references um, and that the the plans correlated so Jessup's been delivered both nationally and regionally in the form of training courses um, for what we know as operational commanders, that's the boots on the ground, as well as tactical commanders. Um, tactical commanders often based in control rooms or at tactical coordination centers. Um, and it also includes the, particip the participation of other emergency responding agencies. We've also been delivering a Jessup control room course, and that's bespoke to control room staff so that they can understand how to deal with those initial actions and hopefully save lives, reduce harm, even before the first responders arrive on scene. Because historically, information wasn't being shared. Just despite best intentions, it, it just wasn't happening. So the Jessup vision, is working together, saving lives, and we also tag on to that reducing harm. We're never going to be able to save everyone's life during a major incident because of the nature of what it could be, but we can certainly reduce harm to any further people. A bit like ultimately what your aim is, is to reduce harm to employees, to the public, to those who are um, working for you know your various companies, um, we're we're aiming to reduce harm to try and prevent it from happening as best as possible. But unfortunately, accidents will still happen. The aim of the program was to ensure that those emergency responders are trained, they're exercised because again, there's no point training people unless you exercise them, um, and they need to be exercised to work together. And so 
when we talk Jessup, we're not just talking of the police running a Jessup course. This is a multi-agency course with a police instructor, an ambulance instructor, a fire service instructor, Coast Guard, so that we can deliver as a team the relevant information that's needed. And following that, we will do exercises and we will ensure that the Jessup principles are picked up during those exercises and, and certainly their objectives. So question is, what is a major incident? Is there anybody that is able to answer on the chat? Maybe Adele can let me know. What, what is a major incident? And for those that know me, yes, it's anything I touch. OK, turns into one. But what's a major incident? Have we got any thoughts? Oh, come off speaker and, and let me know. Um, so we've got an incident that requires the response of more than one service. OK. Uh, the example of Hillsborough. OK, yes. Uh, I would say for my, my response would be um, something that is sort of much more outside the norm, where you need a lot of support to 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 control it, to sort it out. OK, well, the textbook answer, as per the joint doctrine, um, and is this also reflected in the Civil Contingencies Act, is an event or situation with a range of serious consequences which requires special arrangements to be implemented by one or more responder agencies. So this bit of legislation didn't look like this back in ooh, the early 2000s. And because it used to say one or more emergency services, i.e. the blue lights. And we had a little bit of wet weather down in Somerset, which kind of hit the news and it kind of got higher and higher and it was pardon the pun a rising tide event and you know part of Somerset disappeared and made lots of villages into islands well the local authority Sedgemoor District Council declared it a major incident however they didn't get the response they hoped for because they couldn't declare it under the Civil Contingencies Act at that time because it should have been the blue lights so the police fairly quickly jumped on board, recognising that it met the criteria and we declared it a major incident. And that then opened up lots of, I'm going to say floodgates, literally. Um, but funding suddenly became available and it grabbed the attention of obviously the prime minister. So an event or situation, range of serious consequences, special arrangements is exactly what Adele said. It's something that's out of the norm. Um, the, one of the most recent major incidents in the Bristol area would have been the public order down at the Bridewell. Well, fire service, they had a few vehicles on fire, but they trained for that. They had enough resources to deal with those fires and they put the fires out. But for the police, we needed what we call mutual aid. We needed assistance from other forces. Well, that's special arrangements. That's stopping business as usual in Avon and Somerset, because, you know, we, we don't have lots of van loads of police officers parked around every corner. You know, they, they are busy. And I think if I looked at the resource screen now, you probably find one or two that are actually not committed. The rest are all going from job to job or dealing with a crime inquiry. So special arrangements for us was bringing in mutual aid. And that was just us, let alone the impact on the economy of Bristol and, you know, how much that cost. So the declaration of a major incident must be shared with other organisations as soon as possible. So that, that's been updated in the latest edition of the framework. Now, like I say, there's learning coming out of different inquests, including Manchester, et cetera, where sometimes information hasn't been shared. So declaration of something that's going to impact other people, we have to share as soon as possible. So the Jessup principles are, quite frankly, um, the way in which we can work together. So 
The first principle is that we must co-locate. We must co-locate with commanders as soon as practicably possible at a single safe and easily identifiable location near to the scene of the incident. So our operational commanders need to get out of the office, get out the car, get to the scene and actually go face to face with the other commanders. The next principle is to communicate. Once we get there, we don't want to be sat or huddled in our little police group or the ambulance group. We need to actually communicate with one another. And you might think this is really simple stuff, and it is, but for so long, you know, the Royal Air Force wouldn't talk to the Fleet Air Arm of the Royal Navy because they were competing with one another, you know, so they've got to communicate. They, you have to share information. So we must communicate using plain English. We try and avoid jargon, and I'm sure the health and safety world's full of jargon. We need to forget that. We need to speak in plain English. The next principle is to coordinate. So we've co-located, we've started to communicate, we've got into that dialogue. We now need to coordinate and coordinate by agreeing the lead service. Now it's not always the police that are gonna be the lead service. We're very good at coordinating, but we might not be the lead service for a large building fire. Uh, the Strachan and Henshaw fire in Bristol um, about three, four years ago now, very much an Avon fire service lead, but the police were needed to help coordinate other aspects. But they were the lead agency. They were the ones who knew how they're going to tackle it. They were the ones who knew about the safety of um, the firefighters and, the, and the, the general public from the plumes of smoke. So we need to identify priorities. What are the priorities right now for dealing with this job? Um, ultimately, saving life is a priority. But at the same time, for us, the police, we've always got that investigation. Who's at fault? Um, quite recently, we had the um, unfortunate fatal accident down at Avonmouth with an explosion where um, obviously four employees of Wessex Water unfortunately died. Now, preservation of life is the priority. At the same time, there's an investigation with regards to health and safety executive, etc. It's not saying it has to take a back foot, but we have to agree the priorities. Priorities are, let's go in and save savable life. Let's preserve the scene. Let's make it safe. Then we can do the investigation. So we, we've got to coordinate. So we've communicated, so we've co-located, we've communicated, we coordinate by agreeing that lead service, checking we've got the right resources and the capabilities. And from there, we can then understand risk. Because unless we talk to one another, we don't understand the other people's risks. Now, if you've ever phoned the fire service, they will ask you a set of questions which are very much about the fire or, or the incident with regards to, you know, are you safe? What's happening? Can you get away? The police version of taking that call will ask completely different questions. Who's to blame? Who saw what? Are there any witnesses? And the ambulance service quite often won't even take a name. They'll just get people there to deal with the casualty. So the three services there are asking completely different questions. And it is even possible to look at three incidents for the same location and wonder if it indeed is the same incident. So by getting the control rooms to talk together better, by getting the commanders to talk at scene, they get a true understanding of what the risk is and what the threats are and what hazards so that we can come up with potential control measures. In simple terms, for business as usual, day-to-day -day things, a road traffic collision with a car on fire. Well, with nearly sort of like 30 years of policing experience, the number of car fires I have walked through is unbelievable. And it's like going on camp with the scouts. The smoke smells nice, you know. But Dennis tells me it's really bad for me and I shouldn't be breathing in that smoke. And so by the fire service actually saying, look, guys, that car is made of this. It's burning off these horrible chemicals. We want you to approach from upwind. You mustn't get too close because your blue latex gloves are going to melt. We can understand the risks 
to ourselves. It's then up to us if we decide to ignore the fire service, but hopefully we're going to listen to them and say, you know what, you crack on, you go in with your breathing apparatus, it makes total sense. But if you don't know about the dangers or the risks, you know, what can you do about it? Um, a recent incident with the Coast Guard. Coast Guard said, we're looking for this missing person with the police. Police don't like the look of your boots because they've just come out of an office. You know, they're not really suitable for going up that cliff path. So you leave the cliff to us. We'll deal with that. You walk in the field. And so by understanding what the risks are, by sharing that information at a command level, hopefully we can prevent injury to our responders, but also ensure the best possible outcome for the casualties. So we've co-located, we've communicated, okay, we've shared information, we've got a joint understanding of risk, and it enables us to have a shared situational awareness. We now know truly what is going on at that scene, okay, and it can only be done by putting all those principles together. And so it now mentions using something called methane and the joint decision model. Now, methane, we're not talking about the gas, okay? This is an acronym that we're gonna go on to. Some of you may be familiar with it. Um, and the joint decision model is the process that we follow for everyday decisions within the police. We call it the national decision model. But when we're working with other agencies, it's the joint decision model. And it, and it may look familiar to something you may already have in your own organization. So the overarching aim of the joint decision model is working together, sorry, working together, saving lives, reducing harm. As I said, that, that's what we're there for. So collectively, we want to make things better, or we certainly don't want it to get worse. So save lives can only be achieved for a coordinated multi-agency response. If we go back to the 7-7 bombings, apparently, I wasn't there, but apparently it took nearly 45 minutes for transport for London to be invited into the command suite to discuss what was happening on their network. You know, we wouldn't dream of trying to run a response to a Radio, uh, you know, radioactive leak from Hinkley Point without having somebody from the power company on the call or in the office. You know, I, I wouldn't trust some of our police officers to change a wheel on a car, let alone deal with a nuclear reactor. You know, um, yeah, sorry, Dennis, I thought I mentioned that. Um, so we need to achieve coordination. We need to work together, and that includes the public and private sector. So any major incident, we should involve a rep from the company. Put aside any investigations, put aside the fact that you think that they may have caused this incident, we've got to actually resolve it first before any investigation. So we've got to work together. It enables us to build that shared situational awareness and it allows us to then move on to gather information. So information intelligence, there is a difference. Information is, is just what's out there. You know, um, Simon Bell's done this. Well, that's information. But if you then provide a bit of evidence, a bit of confirmation about what Simon Bell's done, it turns it into intelligence. It, it, it's been ratified, it's been assessed. So there is a difference between information and intelligence. So we need to find out what's happening. What are the impacts of what's happening? What are the risks? What might happen? And what's being done about it currently? Because you may not know what another service or another organization have already done. And it may well be it's in hand and we don't have to worry. So methane is a way we can collate that information. So the M stands for, has a major incident been declared? And it can be quite simply yes or no. And if it's no, that's fine. We carry on with the ethane part of the message. And that's the exact location of where the incident is. What the type of incident is. 
any hazards present or suspected, access routes to the scene and also consider exits, the egress, the numbers involved, types of casualties, severity, we need to get an idea of that, and which emergency responders are present and those you think that are required. So we're striving to achieve across all the services that the EFANE message is what we get for every single incident when they turn up. We're not there. We've got quite a long way to go. But having a road policing officer on the motorway call up and say, my exact location is junction 21, marker post B121 over six, type of incident, I've got a three vehicle road traffic collision, hazards present, spilt fuel, smoke, and I think there's a bit of ice on the road. Access come in from north and then come off the slipway. Numbers, three people involved, two cars or three cars um, walking wounded. And I need highways, uh, national highways here and also an ambulance. That's how we see information to be shared because when the first commander from the other agency turns up or the first emergency responder, they can talk using EFANE and know what to expect. And it's in, a, it's in an order that they've been trained. So what we're gonna do, we'll just have a quick look at an example of passing a methane. So what we've got there, if you can't quite see it, it, it does look like the wreckage of an aircraft burning. And it is 1845 on a Wednesday evening. Police have received reports about a low flying aeroplane, which is breaking or broke up before crashing into Heathland in the fictitious Westmore National Park. And there's debris spread over a large area. The National Air Traffic Service report that a 10-seater aircraft has sent out a mayday in that vicinity whilst en route from Wales to Dorset. The manifest shows there were 10 people on board and a police officer at scene, he's probably lost, but a police officer at scene reports at least four deceased and a further three seriously injured with severe, with severe burns to most of their bodies. So the other seven are unaccounted for. So the methane message that we would expect from a responder once they get to the scene would look something like this. So major incident declared. Exact location, Westmore National Park between Selworthy Beacon and Henner's Coombe. So they've put a local, local name to it. The grid reference is sheet number and the grid as well as using these days, what three words, because it obviously brings it right down to a three by three square. Type of incident, passenger aircraft crashed onto moorland. Hazards present, fire, smoke, fumes, fuel spill, persons trapped. Access to the scene and terrain is a hazard because our Vauxhall Corsa ain't gonna get up there. Okay, so we're gonna need something a little bit bigger. The access via the rendezvous point at a car park with a grid reference and what three words, and that the egress will be out via Selworthy Beacon. Numbers involved, four fatalities, three casualties with severe burns, three unaccounted for. Police are only at the scene. They want a police search team, drone unit, fire, ambulance, HEMS, as in air ambulance, Mountain Rescue, Coast Guard, Environment Agency, and National Park Ranger Service. So local responders will know people that they want there because the control room in Port's Head may not know there's a National Park Ranger Service, depending on the length of service. So having responders prompt what they want will help save lives. Those rangers will get out there and know their land. They will know what gates to open. So it's really vital that we let the responders recommend who they think they need. So that, that's a methane report. And that methane report would be shared from the police officer at the scene to the control room. The control room would then pass it to all the other control rooms. And then the first fire appliance that arrives on scene, 
the police officer will speak to the fire commander and give them a methane update. And they will keep sharing information in that order. And when they get to hazards, the fire officer will say, oh, can I stop you there? I just want to make you aware that that smoke is particularly nasty because it's lots of burning plastic. Therefore, I'm going to change your RV, which is downwind, to an upwind location. And so we can share information, we can share hazards, we can get that shared situational awareness. So next step on the joint decision model, as we go around the circle, is we need to assess that risk. So we've shared the information for a methane. We can now look at risk and develop a working strategy. How are we going to deal with it? So we've already said different emergency responders have unique insights into the risks. So the fire service are particularly good at risk management. They're probably one of the better ones. The ambulance service are really good at you know, knowing about casualties and you don't want to get them to cough on you or to bleed on you, etc. cetera. Um, and the police will be thinking more about, well, could this person be violent? Or we, we've, we know there's a risk involved with regards to there might be firearms in that house or um, this person's known to carry a knife. So we have different takes on the risks. And likewise, in your world, there's things that you'll be aware of. And, and thinking back to the Avon Mouth explosion, I think we had a gantry at one point that could have fallen down. So we needed health and safety to come in and we needed surveyors to look at what are the dangers to our responders working within you know, what was the scene of an explosion. So by sharing that knowledge, we can get a common understanding. It's not rocket science but it just needs to happen. We can't make assumptions that people know what we're talking about. Um, a risk on this moorland is the fact that all these emergency responders turn up and that the radio system will crash because there's too many users on a mast. But unless you identify that, unless somebody who's got the knowledge shares it, the, the people that don't know won't know. And all of a sudden, there's no radio signal and the radios don't work. So we need to look at risk. We need to develop a working strategy of how we're going to resolve the situation. And it's always considered in context of the agreed priorities. What are the priorities? Well, we're going to get those people that are severely burnt out of there. They need urgent medical attention. The ones that unfortunately are deceased, all we can do is try and be as, you know, <laughs> as good as we can with regards to preserving the scene to, to maintain their dignity, but there's not much more we can do for them. However, we recognize their families and now the victims, and we don't want them to be appearing on Sky News with a helicopter going overhead. So we're gonna make sure at least we can cover them, you know, to hide them from view. And we can inform a jointly agreed working strategy. This is what those commanders and the control rooms will come up with. What is the strategy for dealing with this? So having done that, we look at the working strategy and what are the aims and objectives and who by, who's going to do what. Um, Timescales, deadlines and milestones. You know, um, deadline is we've got to get these casualties out within that golden hour. They, they need medical attention within the golden hour. The milestone will be once they're all evacuated. And where? What, what locations are we looking at? Are we looking at the immediate scene of the incident or are we looking at a, a, a large debris field? You know, wh what are we dealing with and which is the priority? And why? What's the rationale? What's the overall strategic aim? Well, I know what the strategic aim is going to be for the police. It's going to be to pre preserve life, reduce harm, ultimately investigate, prevent, detect crime. But the overall aim, preserve life. That's what we're there for. And how are those tasks going to be achieved? Who is going to do what? OK, you could have people in the water and you've got the fire service and the Coast Guard and the lifeboat all there. Well, don't care who, somebody's got to go in. But who is going to be the quickest? Who is going to not get dragged away to another job? So it might well be, do you know what? 
Coast Guard, you deal with that. So fire service, you can be the backup. And then if you're needed to cut somebody out the car over there, you can go over there. So they need to agree as to how those tasks are going to be divvied up. So we develop a working strategy and apologies, this slide has gone a little bit blurry. Um, th this is taken from the Jessip Aid Memoir, which I said you can download off of the Jessip website. It covers the working strategies and it actually asks some questions of the commanders. So they can go to this and refer to it. Why are we doing it? What do we think will happen? In light of considerations, is the benefit proportional to the risk? You know, we within policing, and I know Dennis will know a lot more about this than me, uh, over the recent years, we've had water incidents where the police have been heavily criticised, where we haven't put police officers or PCSOs into water to do a rescue. Well, they're not trained. They, they, they get throw line training. They don't do swimming training anymore. And besides, th this river is in flood. W you know, would you jump in? Probably not. So are we going to sacrifice two more people to go looking for somebody that's probably already gone? So we need to think, is the benefit proportional to the risk? What do we have a common understanding on? What, what do we all jointly understand? Um, and as an individual, you know, does it fit within my professional judgment? You know, is it reputationally the right thing? You know, I've, I've, I've now got somebody in a, in a pond, they're lying face down. Well, yeah, policy says I shouldn't go in the water, but it looks less than knee deep and it's, it's still, well, well, maybe I can move forward. Maybe I can spin this joint decision model and take, you know, some sort of assessed risk that I'm going to be okay. So there's key steps to identify the hazard, to carry out that dynamic risk assessment. Do you know what? I'm going to go in that pond. I'm going to take my boots off. I'm going to put a throw line on my back so I can be pulled back in. I'm going to take my body armor off so I don't sink. And I'm going to go in and wade out. And that would be, you know, achievable. Identify tasks. Who should be doing what? Oh, thank God the fire service are here. Fire, can you go in the water now? I'll come back out, you've got a life jacket on, and away they go. We can put in control measures. You know, what are those control measures? Okay, fire is not here, but the police officer's going in, they're taking the body armor off, they've taken the boots off, they've got a throw line on them, and we'll put somebody else with a throw line at the other side. There's, there's, there's you know, control measures put in place. We can have a multi-agency plan, to put in place and we can record any decisions we make and that's one of the big ones um, if you ever get the opportunity to listen to a gentleman called mark scoggins he is the solicitor advocate and he defended Cressida dix the met chief during the stockwell shooting and he is a fascinating chap to listen to and he defended her and what he says is he would rather put a thing in front of a court rather than you. So if he can put a decision log, a notebook, a tape recording, a body worn video, you cannot trip up a notebook by cross examining it. It's impossible. You cannot trip up a video recording. But the moment they put you in the dock, you, you've had it. He says the moment they put a witness in the dock, the likelihood is it will go wrong. So by recording decisions, by videoing, by having an instant log, it makes it so much easier because you can record everything you do. And, and I think that's probably a big, big change in what we, the police, have done over the years, because previously we've just done it with the police. Why did you make that decision? Well, with the police. No, no, record it write it down. And our now ex-chief, Andy Marsh, brought in fantastic kit of the body worn, body worn video. And it's not there to catch people out. It's there to evidence. And, and it has. Um, so that's one piece of kit I would 
truly recommend to anybody, you know, if you go into a scene or something, you video what you're doing. So the next step on the decision model is powers, policies and procedures. We look at what laws or SOPs, standard operating procedures we have, how they can influence our joint decisions, but they can also constrain us. As we said, there might be powers, policies, procedures that mean we can't do what we want to do. Um, and some of the, the legal bits, such as the Civil Contingencies Act, we've got obligations that we have to abide by. The Human Rights Act, we, we have to abide by. And of course, the Health and Safety at Work Act, which for every Jessup Commander's course, you'll probably be pleased to hear the commander's get pushed about health and safety because it's not just about their employees but it's people that are acting on your behalf the public who are helping you out so we're not going to go into great detail here because hopefully you know that bit but we do discuss it we do look at who are we responsible for at this scene you know they might not be your employees but they're in your scene they're in they're in your cordon therefore we have a duty of care so Civil Contingencies Act mentions an emergency, okay? And that is an event or situation which threatens serious damage to human welfare in a place in the UK or the environment, war, terrorism, which could threaten serious damage to our security. So there's two terms. There's the major incident one, and there's an emergency. So when UK government PLC declares an emergency, that's what they're talking about. So COVID was initially an emergency. Some areas declared it a major incident depending on the impact. Okay, so it's just to give you a little bit of background regarding civil contingencies. So fourth step as we go along the joint decision model is we identify options and contingencies. We've gathered information, we've shared, we've looked at risk. What are our options? You know, all potential options should be evaluated. Um, is it suitable? Does it fit with strategic direction? Is it feasible? Do we think we can do it? And is it acceptable? Is it legally, morally defensible and justifiable? You know, if we just stand back, then the public are going to be up in arms. We've got to do something. The first fire service personnel to the Bataclan in Paris didn't put out fires. They didn't rescue anybody because there was semi-automatic gunfire going off. There was explosions going off. But what they did, they ran around the Bataclan. Four fire officers ran around the building and gained a situational awareness of what was going on, what windows were open, where the smoke was. Well they've taken positive action. It maybe is not the action they normally take, but by doing that, they probably save more lives and certainly save their own and that of more responders. So is it acceptable? Yes, they, they, they did a really good job. So here we are, options and contingencies. Do we use the aerial ladder platform on the left to rescue the, the worker from the, the top of the, the church steeple? Or do we bring in a Gucci Coast Guard helicopter? Well, it depends. You know, if, if the patient isn't that badly injured, well, probably the safest manner is the extendable ladder. But if they've got to be in a hospital within the hour and it's worth the risk of getting them dizzy as they spin up, then they go in the helicopter. So is it suitable? Is it safe? What's the option? Well, if the aerial ladder platform don't work, the contingency is a helicopter or a rope access team and we'll put them over on ropes. So we've got to think of these, these contingencies. So here we go, Dennis, here's one for you. We've got some firearms, firearms police officers in the mud. Luckily it says head loo and it's not even the Somerset. Um, pulling somebody out the mud or do we wait five minutes, 10 minutes for a Coast Guard rescue team to arrive with all the kit? And they're not going to get polluted. They're not going to lose their guns in the mud. You know, I dread to think what happened after that job. But what's the most suitable? So finally, having 
spun this wheel. We're going to take action. We're going to go in. We're going to deal with it. And in doing so, we're also going to review. It may not work, and we have to spin the joint decision model again and reassess because we've got new information or plan A didn't work. So it builds our situational awareness by taking action. It sets our direction. We can look at those options and evaluate them. And it, as I said, it feeds back and we can keep spinning the wheel if it doesn't work. So there's the joint decision model. OK, we've spun all the way around it. And this is something that we've just done in yeah, 25 minutes. But police officers, ambulance officers, fire officers, Coast Guard, they do within seconds. Now, more complicated incidents, they will be writing all of these down because, you know, gather information. I'm on my way to a burglary. Right. Um, I know it's a house in the middle of nowhere. There's a front garden, back garden, and they can get out into fields. Right, assess the risks. Oh, they could be armed. They, they might have something. Uh, right, strategy will be, um, right, we're, we're going to use our taser. Um, we've got parva spray. Great. Powers, policies, procedures. Well, they've broken the law because they're being a naughty boy or girl by breaking into someone's house. Um, policy says that I can go because that's what we're here for. Um, procedure says we will yeah, go and arrest and detain and put them before a court. So that's good. Identify options. Uh, right, we might want the dog, we want a dog handler, and let's get the police helicopter en route. We get there, we go through the front door, one round the back. Oh my God, they've now gone into the roof. Right, spin the wheel again. What options have I got? We can put the dog up through the loft space. That's one option or we get a rope access team in. That's another option. So we can keep spinning the wheel within seconds and we document it. And, and this is like say what all police officers nationally do. But in the joint environment, this is what we're doing for every other major incident or every other multi-agency incident. So really that is Jessup in literally 45 minutes because I'm trying to cram a 10 hour session down. Um, there's a lot more information on the Jessup website and there's some lovely videos to watch as well. But if you're in an environment where you are involved in major incident response, what I would say is for the respective police areas that you live in. So if you're in Avon and Somerset, make contact with us. And if we can get you in on a Jessup commander's course, so that you can benefit from it. We will certainly try to, okay? Um, and we spend a lot longer going through different scenarios and reviewing each of these tiles and explaining exactly what we have to record and, and what we're looking to achieve. So that is Jessup. It's primarily about sharing information, working together, it's about gathering information using methane and ethane, and then using the joint decision model to make those decisions. OK, so I'm going to ask Adele, is there any questions at the moment? Thanks, Simon. Um, I have put a link to the Jessup website in the chat Brilliant. so people can access there. Um, there's a there's a few questions. So. Um, is there anything that we can do to make Jessup's life easier should the worst happen on my site? Um, yes, and, and, and that is have plans in place. It's so much easier to turn up and not have to think of everything when there's a plan um, and that that plan is tested. There's no point having a plan that hasn't been tested. It needs to be validated. Um, so as a commander, if they turn up to a, an incident, they'll want to know what that site has got in place and how current is that plan. And hopefully that it, it, it does work. We, we, we talk about things like Hinkley Point. We talk about um, sites like uh, Butlins Holiday Park. Well, if they got to evacuate Butlins because of a bomb scare, we don't have to think about how to evacuate it because they should have the plans in place. You know, we don't want to reinvent the wheel but we might have to assist in 
reorganizing it because guess what you know where they've evacuated people to is actually where something's happened okay so planning is really important and i think where people can adopt the jessup principles the joint decision model um, methane ethane reporting especially methane and ethane reporting if you report to any of the services and say i've got a methane report for you they'll know exactly what you're talking about so so that would be of great help lovely thank you um there's quite a lot of chat um going on around lessons learnt. okay um so some of the questions so what changes can we expect from the key learnings from manchester was jessup used in the manchester bombings if not um if it was if if it should have been used but wasn't would it have made a difference um and should we get to the point where jessup is so developed that it's kind of almost like a business as usually it, it clicks into place naturally when when such horrible events occur yeah. sorry that's quite a lot of questions in it, one it, but it's, it is. it's so, all around the same sort of area so starting off at the back um yet yeah, the aim is it becomes business as usual and it's fair to say you will come across some police fire ambulance commanders that it is business as usual and they totally understand it operationally frontline officers because we've got a lot of new police officers for example not all of them have yet got that experience and not all of them have done courses so there's still a little way to go operationally with the younger officers but it is becoming business as usual it is becoming the fact that any one of our utility companies major sites of enabling and somerset have adopted you know a lot of these uh, policies especially where they're in the, um you know they're providing yeah, power, etc. The power stations, the water companies, you know, that yes, a lot of them have built it in. Um, regarding Manchester, obviously, I can't comment too much. But yes, learning is already coming out. And that learning came out on the Kurz Lake report. It's an open source document, you can go online, look at the Kurz Lake report. And a lot of the learning has already been adopted around the UK. I would like to say that we in Avon and Somerset and the others in the Southwest were already there. I would, you know, I'd like to say that. Yes, there's learning that we've picked up and we will always continue to learn. But there's processes in place. We have very good working in the Southwest as a region um, with one another where we, we share resources, we share equipment. Um, and I think we are generally yeah in a good place there will be learning jessup was used at manchester um it might not have been used as effectively in certain areas and i think you know there's no secrets that the fire service weren't on the scene for a couple of hours because of a breakdown in communications so that that wasn't great um yeah I, I, all i would say is th there will be learning um but a lot of that learning has already been shared. And we have a thing called um, Joint Organisational Learning, JOL. And this is where um, following debriefs around every agency, we feed into this national JOL system, which belongs to Jessup. And it might be that a fire service on this particular day used a throw line uh, in a water rescue and it snapped. So they will feed back not only as a health and safety thing, but they'll feed back, you know, observations, what went well, what didn't go well, and what could we do better next time. And from those Joel reports, I'll then contact Dennis from our police health and safety and say, do we know about this? Do we have any? Um, over to you. Do you want to warn the do you want to warn the guys? So joint organizational learning and debriefing is really important. And it is hand in hand that at the end of any incident, you must have a debrief, be that a hot debrief on the roadside to capture that immediate learning or a structured debrief, a formal debrief, ideally within four to six weeks of the incident while it's all fresh. Sometimes it's a little bit longer, but by capturing those lessons, we have a duty to then 
report it upwards, sideways, and share what we've learned. Because it could be that absolutely everything went, went right. You know, and I'd like to say that I often get people say, Simon, that went really well. Why did it go so well? And it will be, well, we just did what, what we've practiced. Um, or it could be, yeah, that didn't go quite so well. What are we going to do differently next time, Simon? So we, yeah, debriefing, lessons learned, really important to share. And to be fair, we have a duty with all organizations that you don't keep that. You must share it. You know, it would be terrible if one of the petroleum plants at Avonmouth, for example, had an explosion and they know it was down to this particular action. If they don't share it and it happens again, surely they have a responsibility. You know, um, there's always going to be professional, you know, um, commercial sensitivities. Well, Inquest will pick up on that. And during the Gloucester floods, I'm sorry, I'm going on about it. During the Gloucester floods, there was a great big donut building in Cheltenham. Apparently it's quite important, but this great big donut building is served by a power station, you know, a substation in a field. But that field was very quickly becoming a swimming pool. But because the information wasn't shared by the company that ran that substation, because of commercial sensitivities, we nearly lost the donut. And that was really important because that building, if you're guessing which one I'm talking about, is critical to the UK. So one of the reports that came out of that was that we must share information. You know, it may be shared in an environment where it's not public, but we have a duty to share information, to learn lessons, to prevent further harm. Because I certainly wouldn't want to be that company if I didn't share it. I think the board of directors would probably get rid of a few people. OK, so hopefully that's helped there. But yeah, Manchester, there is there is lessons coming out and I'm sure there will be a lot more learning to be had. Yeah. That's lovely. Thank you. Um, I think we're going to probably have to wrap up the questions. We've had some great feedback. Um, so, Nathan, thank you for your comment. I found Jessup to work well at large incidents, not necessarily major incidents. Sharing of information is important and joint working is key. Thank you for an informative presentation. So, um, yeah, there's some great feedback. You might have to work on your Welsh, though, Simon. OK. <laughs> 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 well, it's across the water from me, but yeah. Like, yeah. Um, but yeah, that, thank you for, for answering those questions. Um, no worries. So thank you. I've thank you for link, having me. I've, I've put the link um, in the in the chat. Does that, um, that Jessup website have more information about the courses that... that, that uh, no, the... no. So the courses are normally through each of the police service areas. OK, so if someone here is dialing in from uh, outside of the southwest, um, you make contact with your local police service, especially the local resilience forum. You go through the local resilience forum, they'll be able to assist you. Lovely, thank you. I'm going to pass over to Tony now. Thank you. Thanks very much, Adele. And Simon, thank you for that. That was ever so informative and uh, really delighted you could make the time for us to uh, um, listen to you there. And I know you're a busy man. And just one question from me, actually. When you do have a major incident, which hat do you choose to put on? Oh, it's normally the one that has the least amount of work to do, I think. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I quickly put on a green uniform, come ambulance and run away. No. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm often very busy, but um, yeah, it's probably the blue one. Yeah every time thank you yeah. very much and dennis it's nice to see you i remember you from my training uh, many years ago and um, oh, that's good. You the call. You, that's going um, back a while sorry dennis i was just going to say that's going back a while <laughs> well not, not too long i like to think um <laughs> thanks very much everybody it's, it's been a pleasure to see everybody on the call uh, and thanks once again simon but if that's it then i'm happy to close up anything from you paul just, uh, thanks again and thanks Simon and, and to everybody on the call and um, we'll make the brunch, uh, we'll make the recording and the presentation available by the brunch uh, website as well so we'll let you know when that's available to you and uh, thanks again so we'll, we'll end the meeting there and we look forward to welcoming you to the next bench meeting. Okay. Lovely.
Take Thanks care, everybody. everybody. See you again right, soon. Thank Bye. you.